Good afternoon, one and all, and welcome back to another session of Learn from the Masters. Uh, for today's session, we'll be having Dr. R. Madhu Kumar, who is a veterinary surgeon at Shankarai Hospital, Guntur. He'll be giving a talk on intraocular foreign bodies. Over to you, Dr. Madhu. Thank you, sir. So, <clears throat> hi, all. Uh, so, today's topic is intraocular foreign bodies. This is uh, an important topic from uh, both the postgraduate point of view and also for uh, for that matter, any ophthalmologist, because uh, these are the cases where they come to you as a first contact, irrespective of whether you are an anti-segment surgeon, a post-segment surgeon, or uh, of any specialty. So we, we need to know the uh, broad uh, guidelines of uh, managing these cases and how to go about it. <clears throat> so in coming uh, 40 minutes or so, I'll just give you the broad outline of this uh, how do they present and what are the investigations that needs to be done. And in the last 10-15 uh, minutes, I'll show a few cases, how we manage it, the different case scenarios and different types of foreign bodies, how it was managed. Well, so, <clears throat> I'm going to the epidemiology. 18 to 40% of this uh, penetrating ocular injuries will result with an intraocular foreign body. Mm -hmm. And it's usually seen in uh, work, workplaces where hammers and chisels or other metal striking tools are used. Majority of these patients are 20 to 40 years of age working men. That's what we will uh, know when we take a history of these patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, so coming to the uh, classification, mm -hmm of uh, ocular trauma, uh, it has been uh, classified in several ways, but uh, most uh, common one, uh, the, uh, the, the basic one will be this, where injury can be classified into a closed globe and an open globe. A closed globe will be uh, further classified into contusion and lamella. What is more important for today's topic is this false and an open globe injury, wherein there's the laceration and then there's an intraocular foreign body. The intraocular foreign body can have uh, the penetrating, perforating, or ruptures along with it. So the general classification of ocular trauma is uh, much more wider, where we take it as a local, that is non-mechanical and mechanical. Association or environmental is what uh, this whole thing says. So what is more important for us, we, we will be dealing with the globe, because intraocular foreign body means the, uh, the, the foreign body is lost inside the globe. So under that comes the closed globe injury is extraocular foreign body and open globe injury will be intraocular foreign body. So coming to the types of foreign body, it's very important to uh, know the type of foreign body. And this is usually we can, uh, to a certain extent, we can make out what is the type of foreign, foreign body by taking a detailed history. So it is important because the management depends on what type of foreign body you are dealing with. So the basic uh, types of foreign body uh, are, uh, can be divided into an inert and toxic ones. In inert foreign bodies, again, there can be metallic like gold, silver, and platinum. The non-metallic ones can be like glass, carbon, stone, porcelain, and plaster or rubber. The toxic ones are the one which can create reaction in the inside the eye. And they can be, again, subdivided into metallic and non-metallic. The metallic ones will be uh, iron, steel, uh, no, no, and nickel, which are magnetic. The non-magnetic ones will be copper, aluminum, mercury, and zinc. Again, this is important because once uh, you know that you are dealing with the um, inert material, when I come to the management of uh, the foreign bodies, uh, we'll uh, go in a little bit detail about it. Metallic and non-metallic helps in uh, seeing whether how to go remove these in bodies. So if it is magnetic, we need to have an intraocular magnet uh, handy on your table. If it is non-magnetic, we may have to reserve to the foreign body forces. Coming to the pathophysiology, the damage to the eye <clears throat> will, uh, caused by these foreign bodies depends on certain factors of which most important factor is size and shape. A less than two millimeter foreign bodies usually do not cause uh, much of a mechanical damage. They usually uh, create a self-sealing wound, but they can traverse quite a bit. They will get lodged uh, either inside the vitreous cavity or they can pass through and through the retina and choroid and they can get lodged in the 
orbit depending on the speed or the velocity which they are traveling. The second most important thing will be the reaction. The kind of reaction which these foreign mm -hmm. bodies can elicit uh, di uh, differs from each foreign body. That will uh, this, uh, uh, that will be the, uh, the, the 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 reaction caused by these foreign bodies will dip, uh, will actually dictate the prognosis of that particular ion. The composition is again another important thing because if it is an iron or copper, it can lead to special kind of reaction which we'll uh, see a little later. Infection is most important thing which you have to keep in your mind because it's the single most prognosticating factor. Uh, if the, the, and the management also depends on the presence or absence of infection or how to prevent infection to some extent. The momentum at the time of impact will, de will decide whether the intraocular foreign body is going to get lodged inside the corneal stroma, in the sclera, or in the antechamber, or inside the lens or vitreous cavity, or in the retina. So depending on the momentum and the size and shape of the foreign body, in any of these layers, it can get um, the lodged. So the initial and subsequent damage is something we need to assess. A foreign body can cause an immediate damage because of these things, what I mentioned. Subsequent damage can be because of the changes it can cause inside the eye, like the reaction, or because of the mechanical effects like iridocyclitis or a sphincter tear, where the patient can have dilated pupils and have photophobia, et cetera. And Last but not the least, is sympathetic ophthalmia. So the infection, metallic are usually sterile, but they can still cause intraocular infection because of the, the connectable flora, which can now gain access because there is an open globe or uh, uh, seemingly an apparently uh, self-sealed wound can have a forced serial positive or whenever the patient rubs or blinks forcibly, it can uh, given access for the external uh, connectable flora. Wood and stones carry a higher chance of uh, infection because of their size and uh, uh, the velocity. They may not have that kind of velocity wherein the heat generated sterilizes them. It's only with the metallic which that kind of heat which is generated uh, does not carry infection on the metal per se. But still the infection can uh, gain into the uh, access into the eye with the connective flora. And ophthalmitis and pan ophthalmitis are, will occur if the infection is not managed immediately. Coming to the reaction, an inorganic foreign body usually do not cause any reaction. Local irritate you with encapsulation. This is a limited uh, reaction which we see with certain foreign bodies like lead and aluminum. Separate you, this is a lot of inflammatory reaction is what we see from uh, the elements like pure copper, zinc, and mercury. And specific reactions like cirrhosis and chalcosis are seen with iron and copper alloys, respectively. Now, coming to the investigations, uh, especially for the postgraduates, this can be a, a stock viva question for you people. So, x ray, though it is not the investigation of choice in the present uh, era of uh, VR practice, but it is of importance. Uh, from the exam point of view. So X-ray can be utilized uh, for the local, if not to the precise localization of foreign body, but just to see if the foreign body is there or not. And the localization can be vaguely uh, or to some extent uh, pointed out using certain techniques. It can be like a simple movement of the eye. You can ask the radiologist to take an X-ray with a straight gaze and then ask the patient to look up in the up gaze and then down gaze. Now, considering the center point of the eye as the mid vitreous cavity, the movement of the eye and the respect to movement of the foreign body can give you a rough idea whether it is in front of the center point where it will move along with the gaze or if it is behind the center point that is the post vitreous cavity or on the retina where it moves against the gaze. That is a rough thing. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, uh, there are uh, things which have been historically mentioned like a radio opaque markers where you can place a limbal ring, which is radio opaque, and then X-ray can be taken in different cases. Or contact lens with radio opaque drugs have also been described in the literature. So in the present era, X-ray is not adequate. It does not show the exact location in relation to the soft tissue. It may show just presence and that too, the smaller foreign bodies <clears throat> may be missed 
and the radio lucent foreign bodies may not be detected in x-rays coming to the b scan uh, it is the most common screening modality because this is one tool which all of us the ophthalmologists have an access to the high reflectivity and after shadowing is a typical picture of a metallic foreign body localization uh, is better with b scan and b scan in fact scores over a uh, ct scan and uh, mri wherein we can uh, delineate the associated intraocular damage in terms of vitreous hemorrhage or whether the foreign body is uh, associated with the retinal detachment or with suprachoidal hemorrhage or the choroidal detachments. So it is either on par or better than CT scan to some extent. Apart from this, the mobility can be assessed with the dynamic uh, B scan where you ask the patient to move his eyes and then stop and the after moments of the foreign body will tell us that it is lodged in the vitreous cavity and it is freely mobile. Uh, the disadvantage of uh, B scan will be it is difficult in anti segment, though the water bar technique can be used, but it may not be very precise. Uh, the foreign bodies which are deeply located in the orbit may not be picked up very well in the B scan compared to the CT scan. Glass, the vegetative, the radiolucent are more challenging, though they will show hyperechoic uh, uh, the echo. Hyper echoes, but it may not be as simple as to pick up uh, compared to the, the metallic ones. Open globe, again, this cannot be performed or it has to be performed with a very, very utmost caution because there is a higher uh, risk of uh, infection. One, second, the, you may uh, exert a pressure and allow the intraocular content to pop out. So, B scan in setting of an open globe has to be avoided as much as possible, but at this clinician discretion, if the wound appears to be self-sealed or if no other modality of investigation is possible, then with the closed globe and very gentle manipulation, this scan can be done. The most important factor with the B scan is it is operator dependent. So I may pick up a foreign body with a particular size, uh, whereas the, the, the exam, examiner Y may not pick it up or he may pick it up and may say that is, the size is different because the exact positioning of the probe and the experience of the examiner comes into the picture here. Coming to the CT scan, this is the method of choice for most of the foreign bodies, barring the plastic and wood, where MRI could be the better than CT scan to some extent. 100% detection rate for more than 0 0.05, uh, 0.5 millimeter cube uh, area foreign bodies. It gives us an exact localization of the foreign body, which is important when you are planning the management of the removal of the foreign body. Delineation from the adjacent tissue with respect to the sclera lens and optic knob, which is again important to prognosticate. <clears throat> when we counsel the patient regarding the, uh, uh, the post-operative visual recovery, this is most important and also as a medical legal documentation. The readily sent foreign bodies can be identified, uh, which is difficult in case of X-rays and B-scan and can be performed in open group. So the disadvantages are certain drawback to CT scan or metallic, uh, the hyperdense with, uh, sorry, uh, the, we can differentiate the foreign bodies in CT scan. The metallic will usually show the hyperdense uh, with streak artifacts. The glass foreign bodies will show oval shape and there will not be streak artifacts and similar density as that of the cortical bone. The size will be near accurate compared to other methods and it is not operator dependent. So the optic now and brain imaging along with the uh, eye and uh, orbit will again help us in uh, prognosticating the, uh, the outcome. So CT scan uh, as of now is the investigation of choice. Uh, certain drawbacks will be patient cooperative is required. Uh, the cooperation of the patient is required. It is expensive compared to the other uh, like X-ray and B scan. Radiation exposure to some extent is an issue. Motion artifacts can be there if the patient is not uh, cooperative or if the foreign body has certain type. The low sensitivity of uh, it is it has a little low sensitivity for organic foreign bodies, and if there is an associated uterine damage, it may not be very well delineated. Uh, all these most of these shortcomings are overcome with the the recent helical or the spiral CT scans. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, if on the screening, if we come to know that the foreign body is inert, that is the vegetative or wood or plastic, MRI may be a better one, but MRI has, if, if you are taking the patient for MRI, you have to be sure 
that it is not a metallic foreign body. So with that, we come to the management of intercolor foreign bodies. So history is very important in, the, in these cases. So uh, it gives us a clue about the foreign body, whether we are dealing with a wooden foreign body or a metallic foreign body or a stone. Most of it we usually we see is, is a metallic foreign body. Again, it's important for medical legal aspect. We have to mention the exact time uh, and the whatever the alleged uh, trauma or the history of the patient gives, we have to mention it. And for all practical purpose, even if the patient says that he's not going to pursue a medical legal uh, case or anything, we need to consider this as medical legal case because a one month later, the patient might come back and say that he, he needs a wound uh, report. Because at that time, somebody might tell him that if he pursues, if he puts a case, he might get some compensation. So from a clinician point of view, any trauma case, especially an intraocular foreign body case, is medical legal uh, and it has to be dealt that way. Sometimes we can see a vague description to no complaints. The patient might come for us uh, for a routine follow-up and we see that one old foreign body is lodged inside the eye and some uh, faint uh, limbal scar or a corneal scar will be there. So patient will be just walking uh, somewhere and then there, there, there can be a high a foreign body with high velocity, might have just uh, entered their eye and they might feel that it just dust and they might have rubbed it off. So it can be as vague as that to that there, there may be no complaints. Uh, so we need to elicit a good history in these patients. Clinical suspicion and subtle signs are very important in these cases. Coming to the examination, uh, complete examination of both the eyes is important. The eye and adnexa, uh, sometimes we'll see a small entry, uh, uh, entry wound over the lid where we need to stretch the lid because of the eye creases, the, 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 the entry wound may not be very clear. <clears throat> Conjunctive lira have to be thoroughly examined. The cornea intersegment and iris or look for any defect like an iris hole or an intersegment, look for the reaction or any path can give a clue. Gonia is needed to rule out uh, the foreign body slot in the angle. Fundus evaluation is to be done a good indirect examination is must. Coming to the treatment, <clears throat> all the foreign bodies needs to be removed unless they are inert and sterile. So some foreign bodies like glass, which have entered and which are not, uh, which are not sitting on the important structure of the eye, like a macula or optic nerve, or if it's not caused a retinal break or uh, uh, any, uh, any any lesion which we feel that can give rise to a problem in the future, it can be left alone with a masterly observation. That is, we need to see the patients frequently, say, um, so initially a weekly, and then a month, and then so on. So barring the, those uh, few cases, all the foreign bodies needs to be removed. Once you have seen a foreign body case, we need to protect the globe with the eye shield immediately because most of this will be open, open globe injuries with the larger defects. Cleaning up the surrounding area to prevent the migration of the uh, infection inside the eye. Uh, and judicious use of antibiotics. The extent of damage has to be assessed. The size and type of the intraocular foreign body, uh, we need to know beforehand, bef uh, before, handing, uh, before doing this case. Uh, at this juncture, uh, I would like to mention that before operating any foreign body case, we need to have either an X-ray or a B scan or CT scan, which is a must, barring the primary repair. If there is a corneal tear or a extensive or limbal tear, you don't have to have any of these investigation. You can do a primary repair and then send the patient for investigation. And as a two-step procedure, we can look at the removal of the foreign body later. So whether to go for a single step or two step, I will explain in the subsequent cases, which we have going to, which I'm going to show. So overall, the guidelines for management of foreign body remains the same. Uh, production of the eye shield, cleaning of the surrounding area, like a first aid, we need to do all these things. And once we know the size and type of the foreign body, we need to adapt different treatment strategies. So coming to the complications, Endophthalmitis has been reported in 2 to 48% of the uh, uh, intraocular foreign bodies. Uh, if it is organic, then we can have a fungal infection. Uh, delayed removal uh, or a large wound can again lead to all this 
complications. So foreign bodies are handled as early as possible where the encapsulation is not started yet or the intraocular damage is not that extensive. So better to do it within 48 hours if the extent of damage uh, permits us to do. If it is severely damaged, if it needs to be handled in two steps, then it's a different story. Continuing the complication, there can be a funnel tear, scar, traumatic cataract or hyphema, which has been um, uh, noted in the literature. It can be to the extent of 60 to 75 percent. Retinal detachment or injury seen in 5 to 40 percent. PVR is one of the most uh, uh, common occurrence in these cases, in case of retinal detachment. Sympathetic ophthalmia, though it is less, but if it happens, it is a dreaded complication. So 0.2 to 2 percent is the uh, incidence and optic neuropathy can happen. So prognosis will depend on the presenting visual activity, the presence or absence of endophthalmitis, uh, the globe rupture, the perforating injury, the retinal detachment, or upper, uh, the afferent pupillary defect. So any of these things, if they are present, then uh, we need to use these as a prognosticating factors and we need to explain patient very clearly that the uh, the visual outcome is not going to be the, uh, the uh, not going to be good in case of severe injury, and the patient may need multiple procedures. So the poor outcomes are, uh, according to the literature, the indicators are poor present visual activity and afferent pupillary defect, presence of hyphema, vitreous hemorrhage, balance of VH is a strong risk factors for PVR, uveal prolapse, and retinal detachment. So with this, uh, I'll uh, show a few cases, how they were handled and with the uh, different types of foreign bodies. So uh, this is a case one where a 50 year old gentleman came with a sieving needle injury to the right eye of two days duration. So this was the picture, left eye is absolutely fine. Right eye was one finger close to face. It was a self sealed lid laceration of 0.1 millimeter. The conjunctival laceration was three to five millimeter noted. Fundus examination revealed vitreous hemorrhage with vitreous incarceration at six o'clock. So this is the V-scan. You see that there is uh, vitreous hemorrhage and incarceration inferiorly here. So there's no evidence of foreign body and the uh, posterior test attachment was noted. The so provisional diagnosis of uh, penetrating injury with vitreous hemorrhage with vitreous incarceration was made. Type is open globe injury, grade D and zone three. So, and we see it looked like a, these uh, self sealed conjunctival laceration. So, on exploration, uh, we saw that there was a. <clears throat> so, this patient was taken up for surgery uh, as a single step surgery. The plan of the treatment was to repair the, uh, the scleral tear, if it is that wound exploration primary repair, along with the vitrectomy because the globe was formed. So you can see that the tear was sitting just behind the rectus, the inferior rectus. Now the option was either to disinsert the uh, inferior rectus and uh, suture it. So we thought of not doing that uh, extensive surgery. So we just placed a 42 band small piece of 42 band because suturing there was also difficult because of the, the accessibility. So we just placed a 42 band, which to support the tear. And then we went ahead with the vitrectomy. So all the vitreous was removed and you can see this is the tear, the retinal tear, which was cleared and the laser was done. And this was the exit wound. That was the entry wound and this was the exit wound. Fortunately, the patient did not have retinal detachment. So this patient was taken up for the surgery immediately because the eye was formed, it was formed. It was the entry wound was small, self sealed. So in such cases, we can manage in a single step. So this is a one week post-op. This is the three weeks post-op and the patient, we are left the patient with air and they maintain sexual visual activity. Second case, a 20 year old, 28 year old male. Symptoms are sudden onset of pain, redness, watering in the right eye. History of trauma to the right eye four hours back due to chip while grinding the stone. On examination, patient had hand movements, full thickness radial corneal tear around two millimeters from the limbus at five o'clock with traumatic intumescent cataract. 
and uh, the B scan showed a foreign body with aftershadowing. So this case was, uh, uh, it was likely to be the metallic foreign body because of the history. So uh, it, it, it can be removed to the magnet. So before starting the case, so these are the details which we have, which we had. So this is how this case was managed. <clears throat> So initially, the vitrectomy was done. The, the debulking of the vitreous was done. And you can see the foreign body here. It is in the vitreous cavity. <clears throat> so once it is removed, you can see that this is the intraocular magnet, which is held in the non-dominant, that is the left hand. This port is extended and this is a basket forcep which we use. So this is called handshake technique. The magnet is used to lift it up off the retina and then it is grabbed on the basket forcep and it is removed. And this patient also had an incident, a CSR kind of picture. So this is a PVD induction where the, it is stained with the tricot and we're using a 24 gauge needle to clear up the edges. So this is a classical uh, type of uh, foreign body removal, which we usually do for the, um, <clears throat> sorry. So for the uh, metallic foreign bodies, wherein the magnet is held in the non-dominant hand and the dominant hand goes with the basket forcer. And uh, the one of the uh, sclerotomies will be extended if the foreign body is small. Uh, less than six millimeter, and if it can be removed through the one of the ports, we remove it, and then we go ahead with the uh, closure in the end. So the problem with this kind of technique is when we remove this, there's some amount of vitreous which follows along with the port, and it can lead to the tears if this is the extension of the port which we have done, and then because of the peripheral vitreous which we are not removed. It can the vitreous traction can lead to a tear. It may not happen on table. It can lead to a break and a week, a month, or years later, patient come come with retinal detachment. So we came up with an innovation where we used a routinely used 23 or 25 gauge intraocular forcep, which you can convert it into a magnet by just placing it in contact with the foreign body uh, with the uh, magnet. So this is another case where we had a. Uh, self-sealed corneal tear with a cataractus lens. So the, the, the routine steps of the uh, management will be the same. The vitreous debulking, release the foreign body of all the vitreous adhesions. And you can see that this is one 23 gauge port, remaining 25 gauge ports. So this four step has been magnetized temporarily and the foreign body sticks to it. You can see here, I'm not holding it, but the foreign body stick to the four steps. So this case being the cataract was already there. The anterior capsule is maintained. I just made a small opening in the center and the foreign body is placed on the capsule. Now again, through a, a clear corneal opening, again, using the same forcep and magnetized forcep, we are removing. You can see it here, the, mag, the forcep remains magnetized and it holds the magnet. So certain kind of innovations are needed in handling this foreign bodies because no two foreign bodies are similar. They are different and we need to use our own uh, techniques and certain innovations to manage in this case. So intravertical antibiotics were injected in this case because there's some exudates and it's a truly sutureless intervention. So coming to the uh, another case, a 30 year old male, this patient had pain and diminution of vision uh, since one day. Uh, history of a glass container blast injury at a factory. The best corrected visual activity was uh, PL and PR accurate in the right eye, 618 in the left eye. On examination, both the eyes had an open globe injury, type C zone one, and pupils negative for REP. So the right eye, upper lid laceration, corneal tear along with the, uh, the iris prolapse, then traumatic cataract. Left eye, patient had corneal tear with multiple glass pieces embedded in the corneal stroma. The patient underwent emergency primary corneal tear repair in both the eyes along with the lid repair. Patient was asked to review the CT imaging. He was lost for follow-up. 
So these are the cases where we cannot do a single step surgery because the extent of uh, the corneal injury is uh, high. So if you put a port, if for example, if you are planning to do a combined surgery, you do corneal tear repair, and then you try to do a vitrectomy because of the infusion, the positive pressure, the, the, the suture tear might open up and the eye will be much more congested. Uh, the visualization can be of an issue. So in these, in these cases, we usually do a two-step surgery wherein the primary repair is done first. And then between uh, one week to for 14 days, we do a, uh, the second step surgery. <clears throat> So this particular patient was last for follow-up. He turned up after one month to the retina clinic where he was seen again and advanced imaging. So this was the right eye B scan. He had a, a foreign bodies here. The left eye fundus examination showed a class foreign body with some amount of vitreous hemorrhage sitting inferiorly. The CT scan showed uh, the three glass foreign bodies in the right eye, not just one. You can see that one, two, and three. And uh, the multiple uh, foreign body, the left eye has one glass foreign body and multiple foreign bodies in the maxillary and infraorbital and frontal regions here. So in inside there, it was just one single foreign body in the left eye. So again, the diagnosis, the right eye, it's an open globe injury with the type C, there's a glass intraocular foreign body, grade four, zone one, with pupils negative. Left eye, open globe injury, type C, with grade two, zone one and pupil negative with vitreous hemorrhage. The patient was posted for right eye lensectomy with foreign body removal. So this is the picture after one month of the primary corneal tear repair. So imagine taking up this case surgery for a combined, it would have been uh, very difficult. So these cases are again challenging because through this is the window where we have to visualize the fundus and do the surgery. So the cataract, whatever remnant of the cataract was that was removed. And you can see there's a glass foreign body there, which is stuck just behind the iris. And thus that is being gently dissected without uh, causing too much of a pull wherein we can cause much more damage to the adjacent structures. There's a foreign body here again, which is stuck to the vitreous hemorrhage. So that was, in this case, this one I could lift it up with the cutter itself in the suction mode. It may not be possible in all uh, cases. So the first foreign body, we just needle uh, or nudged it with the forceps and it is placed over the iris. The glass foreign bodies are very difficult to handle because the forceps cannot grasp them. In fact, when you try to grasp from the forceps, it wow. will create, it will move like a ricochet of bullet and cause much more injury. So visco expression is what I did, which is ideal for glass foreign body removals. Place it on the iris and use visco expression. So this is another foreign body. So far I had removed two, and this is the third foreign body. Now I'm trying to remove the cutter, but it doesn't get engaged into the cutter. So this. This is an extrude needle, which has an end opening. This is a flute needle, like your visco elastic needles. It has an opening, round opening in the end. Or with the suction mode, using this, we could lift it up because uh, lifting this up with the forceps is, as I mentioned, is very difficult. Again, it was placed on the iris. <clears throat> and visco expression was done. So this is the foreign body. So all the foreign bodies were removed. So at one month follow, uh, the right eye, which was PLPR accurate, is now 660 PR accurate. The right eye showed corneal scarring with attached retina. Left eye is 69 PR accurate. And fundus examination still showed hemorrhage on glass foreign body. As I mentioned in the beginning, because glass is an inert foreign body, you need not remove this foreign body in the left eye because the visual acuity is all right. The glass foreign body has not created any uh, retinal injury or uh, cataract, so it can be safely absorbed. Though I keep seeing this patient once in three months. Because the problem with this will be if the glass foreign body is mobile, it can induce the PVD, and the PVD can again lead to the, the abnormal uh, PVD can lead to a retinal tear and retinal detachment, which can ensue. So this is the left eye. 
So this is the right way. Coming to the fourth case, a 43 year old male, his chief patient, uh, his chief complaint was pain, watering, diminution of vision with upper lid laceration in the left eye since two hours. History of iron particle injury while repairing vehicles. His best corrected visual acuity was 66 and 624. So the left eye upper lid laceration measuring eight into one, uh, scleral tear measuring uh, eight into one millimeter, 10 millimeters from the limbus underneath the superior rectus at 12 o'clock. This was the preoperative evaluation which we done. This is very important to know the extent, good slit lamp evaluation, because again, in this case, we need to decide whether to go ahead with a single step surgery or two step surgeries. So on fundus examination, there was an entry wound at 12 o'clock extending from equator to near periphery. Intraocular foreign body was seen inferiorly at six o'clock with vitreous hemorrhage. Coronal detachment, detachment was also noted superior. So the diagnosis was open globe injury type C, that is the metallic foreign body, a grade two zone three, pupils negative with coronal detachment and vitreous hemorrhage. So this case, uh, like the first case which I showed, the uh, we didn't do a muscle uh, disinsertion and repair there because it was very small and I could support it with the buckle. But in this case, the tear is a little larger. So the plan was to do a two-step surgery uh, and the patient underwent primary scleral tear repair in the left eye. So this uh, was done by uh, our senior colleague, Dr. Sairani, the first primary tear repair. So you can see here, the muscle is being isolated, the sutures are taken and it is cut flush. So the disinsertion of the superior rectus is made and see this, the extent of serial tear. So repairing these is important because if you leave it alone, it can slowly it make a scar, but at the extent of that now that we are uh, allowing the, the wound to be open, so this patient will have high increased risk of infection and also the scarring and bad PBR. So repair, timely repair will prevent this devastating complications. So follow up post-op third day, the left eye showed a foreign body and we did a CT scan. Again, it confirmed that a single foreign body in the left eye of 18 to 4.3 to 2.7 millimeter in the left eye. So the patient was posted for left eye partner and after, uh, after one week. <clears throat> so this is a 25 gauge three port vitrectomy being done. Again, the principle remains same, debulk the vitreous and the PF seal is placed over the disc and macula because when you are handling the foreign body, inadvertently it can fall and create damage to the optic nerve and macula. So this is a tricky step where you need to go and dissect. See, it's already capsulated within one week it has formed a thick capsule on the foreign body. So we have to eat up this capsule carefully without causing a retinal tear or traction on the retina. So this is the foreign body which is being delineated from the surrounding thick vitreous. There it is. And the remaining blood in the past is removed. So this is the foreign body here. The laser is done as a prophylactic uh, thing so that the later you don't want to have retinal detachment, there can be a small micro breaks or this vitreous which is left over can contract and um, cause the retinal detachment later. So this is the foreign body here. This is the magnet, non-dominant hand. And this clerotomy has been enlarged to remove this. And removing these foreign bodies, this is pretty big. Ideally, in such foreign bodies, we sacrifice the lens and remove through the uh, clear corneal or a limbal approach. But because uh, this was less than six millimeter uh, and the patient was driver, he's an RPC driver by occupation, I thought of retaining the lens. Though it was a bit of struggle, uh, I could remove it. The most important thing here is engaging the long axis. The shorter uh, dimension has to be engaged in this port. So maintaining this axis is difficult because the edges of the foreign body are not regular, they're irregular. 
So this instrument, which is the basket force that comes very handy in uh, removing this intraocular foreign bodies, this is it. So there's a foreign body which is removed. And this is the post-op. The best character visual activity of this patient is 6-6. Six, six. In the right eye, in the left eye, 6-9. Uh, I left this patient with the uh, with air inside. So this is the last case where a 50 year old gentleman came uh, with one week uh, history of loss of uh, diminution of vision. He gives a history of trauma three years back. So his previous medical record showed that he has a visual activity of 612 in the left eye, six months back. So this was the picture. You can see uh, some kind of scarring here and a pseudo pterygium. So this was the picture. The diagnosis was there was a single harsh shoot tear at 12 o'clock and a granite or a stone foreign body sitting, uh, straddling the retina and the pars plana with thick encapsulation at nine o'clock. So this was the picture, a fresh hardy with an old foreign body. So the idea in, in this case, the challenges are if we remove that foreign body, it is such encapsulated, I might do an extensive uh, relaxing retinotomy. So instead, we know that it's an inert foreign body. It is sitting inside the eye for three years. So we thought of doing a simple buckle surgery and settle the retina and leave the foreign body inside the eye. So I use the chandelier uh, for this, the chandelier assisted uh, buckle surgery. So this is the drainage of SRF here. We already placed a 240 belt. So the SRF is drained. So this is a cryo. Sorry for the uh, poor video quality. So this is the break here, the red thing, what you're seeing. And also where the foreign body was sitting, I did a cryo there because just adjacent to the foreign body is a tiny break, suspicious break. So the other side of the foreign body where it was placed, the cryo was done. And a 276 small segment was placed to support the break and also to support the, the foreign body. The foreign body is sitting here at nine o'clock. So the two small segments were placed so that it is taken care. <clears throat> this is the post-op. You can see here, retina is nice and well attached. This is the foreign body with thick encapsulation. And if I were to do a vitrectomy for this, I would have to cut this, uh, this much of the retina without cutting it. It's extremely difficult to remove. This is the buccal height. So this we published in the IJO and we got the best of the IJO award in the recently concluded uh, AOS because of the innovation uh, that we use. That is to leave, a, uh, leave behind the foreign body and uh, take out that another patient even now has a six nine vision. So sometimes we can have the iatrogenic foreign bodies also. So this is one of one of one such case where we were injecting the silicon oil. Suddenly there was a thud, <clears throat> and we saw that the port went inside the eye, <clears throat> sitting on the retina. So and this was removed using a force cell. So in summary, the timely intervention, tailored approach and the right instrumentation along with a bit of innovation is what is needed in uh, managing the intraocular foreign bodies. There is no single rule, single approach for main, man managing the intraocular foreign bodies. By and large, the uh, lines of management remain the same, prevent intraocular infection and remove the intraocular foreign body with least trauma, whether to remove it in, the, uh, in a single sitting or two staggered sitting depends on the case by case ratio. Thank you, sir, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Madhu. It's been a nice talk, very comprehensive, and the cases were nice. Uh, I think there are some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll just take them. Dr. Rahul wants to know that if the haptic of the PMMA IOL is accidentally broken yes, sir. and is in the and lying in the vitreous cavity, do we have to wait or remove it as soon as possible? Okay, so if it's only haptic and if it is not in the visual axis, if the patient is not complaining of the flotus, and if the haptic is not uh, 
too much mobile if it is sitting uh, safely in the inferior retina it can be absorbed but some patients can develop uh, as i mentioned the local reaction they, there can be some amount of vitreous condensation and a break retinal break can happen as a sequel as such it may not be because of the haptic but if it is uh, not if the patient is not complaining if it is not creating any breaks it can be absorbed right uh, dr devakani suresh would want to know that in rare cases uh, we sometimes see the foreign body which is embedded deeply in the cornea Sir. and patient is asymptomatic and is not even aware sometimes and uh, when do we have to intervene is a query again the rules uh, uh, remain the same if it is an inert foreign body and if it is not uh, causing uh, or if, if there is no disease which is progressing say like there is no infiltration then there is no delen or if uh, there is no signs of infection it can be observed if it is inert if it is not then it has to be removed the risk benefit right. ratio has to be uh, taken into the consideration right and dr amrita is asking in the first case which you had operated uh, whether you had to give gas tamponade and uh, was the laser done all through the retina no not exactly the laser was done only where the break was there and uh, the air tamponade was what was injected not the c3 effort at sh6 here that to partial uh, air fluid gas exchange for the closure of ports the tamponades have no role in it because it is there is no detachment and the break was well supported with the buckle so i left it to the air and i think there's another contention to the question again how large a metallic foreign body can be removed by using the magnetized forceps okay uh, the magnetized forceps it it is if you want to use a larger foreign body then you have to use a larger forceps that is the physics like uh, the larger the forceps uh the magnet you magnetize that force up it has to withhold the weight of the foreign body so you have different uh, sizes of force up available like if i have to use a uh, remove a bigger uh, foreign body i'll use a 20 gauge force up if a smaller one i'll use 25 gauge uh we are we have done like uh, three cases till now uh this particular magnetized force up is useful mainly for smaller foreign bodies because anyways the large and foreign bodies you have to sacrifice your lens they would have caused a significant cataract and corneal tear so in such cases uh, we rather use intraocular magnet and uh, bring it to the ante chamber and remove through the limbal so this particular the innovation which i mentioned is usually for small and foreign bodies which we see uh, not, uh, not it's not that rare to see the small and foreign bodies dr ankush would want to know how to make a decision whether to put a buckle in cerclage or oil or gas after a paspenal vitrectomy in the intraocular foreign body with retinal detachment following trauma okay so any retinal detachment uh, in a complicated case like this where you have a trauma or a younger patient where the lens uh, where where the patient is phakic in such cases we usually put belt buckle having said that uh, most of the foreign bodies we handle within one week or 15 days where the detachment has not happened uh, the case scenario which uh, uh, which the concussion may mentioning is if there is already a detachment in foreign body it will be a little longer duration so in such cases it's safer to go with the bent buckle because the idea is you may not be able to remove all the vitreous the peripheral vitreous for two reasons one because of the trauma there will be the dense vitreous condensation second the patient is phakic so the visualization and uh, taking a cut out towards the parsley is slightly difficult third the pupil may not be very well dilated because it's a trauma case and the cornea uh, corneal scarring may be there so the visualization can be an issue so in such cases the amount of vitreous which we are going to remove will be a uh, little bit of uh, uh, questionable so in such cases we do think of putting belt buckle and remove as much vitreous as possible the remnant vitreous will be supported by the buckle and uh, then go ahead with uh, deciding whether to put oil or gas depends on the the extent of pvr changes and the situation of break if the break is anyway superior 4 o'clock hours i prefer putting gas if it is inferior then oil But Dr. Amrutha was was want to know that usually 
in patients who have an intraocular foreign body, there is a little exploration of the subtenant space to look to look for the spiral entry wound. So she would want to know that after how many days post trauma do we have to explore or leave unexplored? Uh, as I mentioned, see the, the, the moment you see the patient uh, with a good uh, slit lamp examination will give you a clue what you are dealing with. If there is a scleral tear, there is a, con a conjunctival tear and scleral mm -hmm. tear wherein the cornea and the lens are spared, then there will be a foreign body tract. There'll be some telltale signs of say there is a, a vitreous hemorrhage or a vitreous traction to a good overall examination. And if you feel that there is a vitreous hemorrhage or there is, an, uh, there is a tract, then you need to explore. If not, there are no uh, signs of uh, any intraocular injury or there's no vitreous hemorrhage. It can be just a conjunctive laceration. You need to do a good examination and leave it. But if at all, there is an element of uh, uh, if there is a doubtful uh, element of say scleral tear, then it's error, better to err on that side. Go ahead and do a conjunctival exploration right away. You don't have to wait because the uh, the important thing we need to keep uh, we need we need to remember is the vitreous which comes out of these tears is like a broth for the bacteria. It is a culture media for the bacteria. So the conjunctal normal conjunctal flora can gain access, and all these foreign bodies. Uh, can carry their own uh, uh, bacteria along with it. So it's better to repair immediately. As right, a reason. Doc, right, I think that answers it. Uh, Dr. Keshif, we want to know uh, what may be the ideal timing for a delayed vitrectomy and the factors which influence such a decision. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, if there is a large corneal tear or a large mural tear, so in these cases, when you when we repair, uh, and immediately if you want to go into vitrectomy, we put an infusion port, and because of the positive pressure, the the tear which you are repaired may start leaking. One second, if there's a large foreign body which is going and sitting on the sclera, uh, on uh, which is thrown through, the uh, part of it is subretinal and uh, it has made a large uh, defect in the choroid. You try to remove this that defect itself may allow the air, the saline and oil uh, into going to the orbit. Dr. Rajesh, my colleague has shown the one excellent video where <clears throat> uh, the he had one such case and when he removed it, all the PFCL, everything started going into the uh, orbit. So he came up with an innovation where he put this agent, which is used by the octoplasty people and the orthopedicians, he plugged it and then he was fortunately was able to complete that case. So the decision when to operate depends on your uh, uh, the extent of primary uh, tear and the repair which was done. The ideal thing is the eye should be stable, firm, and you should be able to visualize uh, well. Otherwise, uh, you may have to think of like putting a temporary character process and handling this, so on. So overall, when do we reoperate? Usually after one week after the primary repair, one week to 14 days. Right. And Dr. Rajeshri Hirawat wants to know, well, how do you do, manage a deep uh, ocular coat metallic foreign body? Um, this, uh, this is where the uh, CT scan is helpful. So if we see that uh, uh, by and large, the major part of it is embedded in the sclera, and if uh, there is no retinal detachment or uh, the, the intraocular uh, managing it from inside there is difficult, then we can go through the sclera, the ab external, where we can disinsert one of the muscles, rotate the eye, and remove it from the other end. Otherwise, most of it, uh, we remove it from the inside the eye only. Right. The vitrectomy approach. Uh... And Dr. Sunil will want to know, uh, what is the preferred anesthesia in most of the trauma surgeries? Uh, unless it is a pediatric, most of the times we use a local uh, peripheral bar uh, anesthesia only, but yes, it's a good question. The block has to be given very carefully because the issue is when you, in, in open globe injury, when you give a peripheral bar block, the ocular contents can uh, pop out. So if the, the trauma is so severe that giving a block or increasing the intraorbital pressure can 
worsen the uh, the amount of expulsion of the intraocular contents, then we have to go for gel anesthesia. Otherwise, if the tear is small, the uh, volume of the orbit which we are going to increase with the injection, the pressure which is going to uh, create, uh, if we think as a clinician, if we think it's not it's not going to open up the tear uh, or worsen the um, the amount of uh, ocular contents popping out, then we can still stick with peribulbar. So it has to be based on the individual case. Most of it which we have handled are not that uh, large ones, which uh, we have managed with the peribulbar block. And Dr. Ankush has another question. He would want to know how long we should wait for a retina surgery after a primary corneal tear repair in a post-trauma patient in whom the detachment was noticed at the first visit itself. Okay, so if, uh, if, if it permits, if the tear is not very large or if the tear can be uh, repaired uh, very well, then we can do it in the single, same sitting itself. Otherwise, you can wait for uh, five days to one week Keeping in mind and seeing the patient that he is not uh, developing endophthalmitis, you can operate after one week to 10 days. If there is an element of infection, then you have to take a risk and go inside and operate immediately. If it is a detachment alone, you can allow the vitreous to liquefy a bit and operate after one week to 10 days. Right, I think it answers almost all the questions which uh, some of the people had. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Madhu. It was a nice talk very comprehensive and a good cover of all the possibilities and the various ways of removing an intraocular foreign body. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All. And uh, for tomorrow's talk, we'll have a session by uh, Dr. Minija, who is our consultant in medical retina and uvia services at Shankarai Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Minija will be talking on endotrophysiology, mainly pertaining to ERG and VEP. And the time remains the same. It's 12 noon to 1 p.m. And the link also remains the same. So see you all tomorrow. Uh, and stay safe. Goodbye.